Welcome everyone. Uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, building spark streaming pipelines using CAS Hydrator. So uh, we'll just go with some simple definitions to begin with. So what's a data pipeline? So this is something that's commonly, uh, it's a problem that, it's, this is just a problem that's happening in the industry right now, it's in, in big data, where people want to ingest data from different sources, they wanted to do some processing in flight, and then write it to some destinations. So we'll try to find data pipeline as, uh, data pipeline provides the ability to automate complex workflows that involves fetching data from one or more sources and performing non-trivial transformations. By non-trivial transformations, I mean, let's say, dropping a few fields or selecting a few fields based on certain uh, fields value, let's say, if you're looking if it's a sensor data, you are probably looking at uh, some of the sensor values crossing some thresholds, so you're just dropping some records that you are not interested in. But some things you are also performing like um, group bias, groups across multiple data. So that, that's maybe one of the examples that we see, where let's say if you want to uh, compute the average of data across multiple sensors, let's say you want to group the data. And sometimes you might also want to join data, so for example, there might be a data source that's coming from one source and then you want to enrich the data by joining it with some data from a different source. So these are some of the examples of non-trivial transformations. And finally, you would probably want to write this data to some destination from which you be, that data will be consumed by some other source. Probably you're serving this data in real time to some of uh, your users or maybe your BI tools are using this destination data to generate some visualizations for you. So that's what, that's a uh, broad definition of what a data pipeline is. And, uh, and as, as you can see today, we will, we will be looking at one specific example, which is applying data analysis. Uh, so in this area and in different parts of this country, noise due to flight paths are pretty common. Uh, and uh, so we wanted to kind of try and address that, take that as a use case and come up with a solution. So we, the goal is we want to find out what are the airports where this problem is quite common. So let's say, we, let's assume that we have a bunch of data sensors that are placed across airports around the country. And not, not just in close to the airports, but in the surrounding areas where this problems are reported. And uh, this, is, this is the data that we get. So, yeah, if you, you may or may not know, actually flights actually emit some data in real time. So if you have the right uh, antenna and sensors, you can actually capture the data and analyze this for yourself. And there are some companies which also provide this for commercial usage as well. But so it kind of can be done in, in field. And so if you want to implement this particular use case using your favorite big data technology tools, uh, some of them might be, let's say, Kafka or, or Spark or MapReduce or HGFS or so on and so forth. So how do you go about doing it? Typically, the way uh, companies sometimes approach this phenomenon, the industry approach this phenomenon is, let's say, I want to use Kafka for data for publishing and subscribing messages. Okay, so let's say I'm using Kafka. Now I have to figure out how to install Kafka, how to manage Kafka, how to use it. Then after that, I want to do some real-time processing on it. So now, what do I do? Do I use Storm? So I have to go learn Storm right now. Learn. And then if I want to use something else like Samza or some other new technology like Flink for data processing. Right. And then after that, you want to store it in uh, real-time, uh, like a NoSQL database. Let's say if you're using HPs, now you have to find some expertise on how to use HPs. Now you're kind of, so now the challenge is you need to get your developers um, get your developers like up to speed on all these different technologies and how to stitch all of them together. And they need to, so since it's also distributed systems, big data technology is fundamentally distributed systems and so there are a lot of uh, fault tolerance scenarios that uh, we, the developers need to be aware of. And uh, sometimes the platforms may not provide you exactly what's processing guarantees. So um, during failure, what happens, how do I recover from failure? So all those different scenarios, the guarantees that are provided by one technology may not be the same as the other technology. So now, if, when you when you stitch all of these together, how does how does it really work? And whether you are actually how confident are you in the, the resulting data? I mean, I have any of this. So 
things like that. Um, as you can imagine, these are all different technology pieces that are there, and each of them have its own complexities, and you're stitching them all together using maybe some a few scripts that your developers have come up with. And it's pretty hard to maintain, as you can imagine, and how do you maintain? Um, and uh, how do you maintain, if you want to upgrade one specific uh, version, how do you maintain, make sure that this stuff still works? And as I mentioned, trying to get developers' expertise and get a developer with expertise in all these different technologies is going to be really, really hard. And uh, if you're going with this sort of approach into production, what, what ends up happening is you're trying to debug it, validate it. A lot of time is spent just evaluating these technologies, actually. In fact, uh, new technologies come up every day. And as you may be aware, uh, that the big data ecosystem has been kind of growing a lot every day. Some new Snow SQL, SQL technology is coming up, some new stream processing framework is coming up. So things are really in uh, motion. So most of the times, uh, companies spend time just trying to evaluate these technologies and not really coming to the end goal of implementing uh, their solution. And even if they do go with the ad hoc approach of trying to work with these technologies in their raw form, um, when they go into production, they're, trying, they're, they're just facing a lot of frequent failures and it's just hard to debug as well. And so for this demo, what we will do is uh, we are assuming that the sensors are actually pushing data into Kafka. And uh, the, we can just look at the, how the sensor data looks like. So, so the, all these sensors which are on let's say they are, uh, they are pushing this data into um, Kafka, and then we are just subscribing to this Kafka from on a particular topic. And we will just do micro batching here. So every uh, that's how Spark streaming kind of works. It micro batches these events which are coming in real time. And so we will micro batch it and process this data every minute. And what we will do is we'll group by the airport code. Uh, so let's say you're getting data from a flight that's uh, trying to land at SFO or SJC. And so you have both, uh, you have the altitude information of the flight. And what we'll do is we'll compute the average of the altitudes uh, by group code. So for example, the average uh, altitude around SFO is, let's say, 300 meters or just throwing some values out. So, um, so we want to be computing that, and then we will filter out the airport codes where the average altitude is less than a threshold. So, let's say our threshold is um, I don't know, 500 meters, um, just a value that we give you. And we, we are just interested in airport, uh, the destination airports where the altitude is less than a specific threshold. So, we want to just filter that data out, and we just want to write this data out to HDFS. And after that, we will try and visualize the data using like a BI tool. In this case, we'll use Tableau to do some visualization as well. And the flight data from the sensors kind of look like this, where you have a timestamp, and then you have the airport port, destination airport port, and then you have the altitude and the velocity. So what we are, this, let's say this is the data that's coming from the sensors, and what we are interested in is the destination airport port and then an altitude. So we we'll group by this destination airport code. So if SFO had another data point which had 400 as the altitude, we we'll group by the airport code. So SFO will get an average of 300 and 400, that will be 350 uh, as the altitude. And after that, so each airport code will have one average altitude value, and then we will compare it against the threshold. And only uh, only those airport codes that kind of uh, have an attitude, have average attitude less than a specific threshold will go through the next stage and that we will just be writing that to a partition in the time So I'll just go to the demo. Um, so what I what you're seeing here is uh, the CDA platform with the Hydrator Studio. So this Hydrator Studio is actually uh, this is the pipeline that uh, constructed that does what I was just explaining to you about. This is a graphical user interface uh, for you to help uh, build uh, virtual pipelines. In this case, it's a real-time pipeline, which is implemented using Spark streaming underneath. But you don't have to be kind of aware of that. You don't have to write any single code to kind of get this pipeline up. So as I mentioned, we are using a Kafka source uh, for our pipeline. That's where we are reading the data from. And so all you need to mention is is what the Kafka brokers are from which you're trying to read, and then the Kafka topic, and uh, what format the data is going to come in. So in this case, we are we have we have a separated format. 
And the schema of the data looks like that. There is a timestamp, there's a destination ad code, there's an attitude, and then the velocity. And then what, what we do is here, this is where we are windowing these events. We are just batching these events together. So here we have a 60 second time interval. So we are uh, processing these events uh, by accumulating them every uh, every minute. And then we are, we are sliding the window every minute. So uh, there is some slide where I'll talk about how, what this width and slide interval means. Uh, so all this right now, it's, it's, what this simply means is that we are actually accumulating this data for one minute and then we are just crossing that in one minute batches. And this next step, what we want to do is now I have this input schema that's coming in. All I want to do is group by the destination airport code and I want to find out the average of the altitude field. And so my output will just be the airport code, which is a string, and then what is the average altitude? And that will be a, it's, that's a double in this case. So the, what this will perform is just group by, uh, group by this ad code. This is like writing a SQL. It's kind of writing a SQL where you're doing a group by, by this destination ad code. And then you're computing the average altitude. And finally, now we, once we have the airport code and then the associated attribute, now we want to just filter out data uh, where we are just interested in a particular threshold as when we are only interested in airport codes where the attribute is less than 500 meters. So this is a JavaScript transform. Um, so you just write simple JavaScript code where you're just computing if, the, if my attribute is less than 500, then you have this particular data. Uh, for all the other rest of the data is all just dropped. So it's just a very simple filter that you can implement using JavaScript. And then finally, we are just writing it to HTFS. Uh, you only need to specify just a data set name, and that's about it. So what this will do is for every second, uh, sorry, every minute, which is the window, which is the bar, which is the interval window, you know, we will create one particular partition in HTFS. Uh, uh, let's say a direction separate between the shapes, and we can just be writing the data there every every minute. So that's what this pipeline is doing. So all you have to so in, in order to do this, in order to kind of develop this, what you need to do is just pick and choose these sources and these transforms and then sync, connect them together, and configure configure each of them, and that's it. Your your uh, pipeline is ready. Up and And in order to do this, we we have something called the Hydrator Studio, where you can uh, where you can uh, construct your your can create these pipelines. So so for real time, we have the Kafka and the Twitter sources. We are adding a lot more sources now, and this is only for and this is for only for real time. And you can you can have a bunch of different transformations that you can actually do. Uh, so, for example, you can you have the windowing that we saw. We have JavaScript transform, and uh, and then for analytics, you can, as we saw, there is a we use the group by transform. We also have a few machine learning plugins like an based classifier that we are adding a lot more now. And then for the sync, we can write to a bunch of different things where you can write to Cassandra, Elasticsearch, you can write to S3, MongoDB, and a bunch of different sources, uh, things, and we are just adding a lot more as we move on. And this is only for the real time case. If you go to the batch data pipeline, and that was the real time pipeline uh, uh, case where this is actually underneath it's implemented using Spark streaming. But we also uh, we can you can also create batch pipelines using Hydrator. And in this case, we have a ton of different batch sources. Like you can read from HBase, you can use you can use FTP, you can read from MongoDB, uh, and a bunch of different places where you can read from. And you have the same set of transforms and analytics that you can actually perform on these. And underneath, this uh, runs using MapReduce or Spark as well. So you can choose which uh, which platform or engine that you want to uh, run, you could, which runtime you want to use. Either you want to use MapReduce or Spark, and this is. It's just a radio button that you can just choose. And as I was talking about the, so this particular Spark streaming pipeline is actually processing the data in real time with Kafka, 
and then finally writing in those papers. And and then how do you really explore this particular data? So this particular you can actually use uh, what we call as explore, which you can write like simple SQL queries to this particular um, data set. So you can just write simple SQL queries here where you can if you are comfortable with SQL, you can just directly write SQL queries to interact with the data sets. Um, what does that mean? That what it does, it just issues I, I jobs to fetch the results from these data sets. But uh, if you're not really comfortable with SQL, you want to use a BI tool to visualize the data. So here we have a Tableau that's installed and it's up and running. Uh, that just give me one second. So here I'm opening Tableau. So what we have an ODBC driver. Um, that's uh, we have seen a ODBC driver that allows you to connect your BI, favorite BI tool to CDAP, and you can explore the CDAPs, the data sets that you're creating using CDAP uh, using your favorite tool. So in this case, I'm going to open a workbook that I already constructed and go to the data source. So this is issuing um, this is issuing a SQL query which goes via the ODBC driver to CDAP and CDAP is actually returning back the data. Um, so what we have is the data set that we were just looking at. So this data set just has the airport code and then the attitude. But just the airport code may not make sense. We want to enrich the data by joining it with uh, this this the other data set which contains a mapping from the airport code to the the actual city scene. So for example, SO code corresponds to the San Francisco. So as you can see here, the data that's written from here, this this particular this, this is the these are the airports which where the altitude or the average altitude of the flights were pretty lower than the threshold. And this is BUR and then this particular this is the name of the city. So this this city information is coming from a different data set, and what we are actually, the, the BI tool is just joining these two uh, data and then it's just showing us the results. So it just, just shows the capability of uh, using a BI tool to be kind of interact with uh, CDAP data sets. And uh, you can also kind of visualize this on a map where you can just see what are the cities where uh, the average altitude was kind of less than the threshold that we have set. And uh, these are just the capabilities that the BI tool is providing. And so you can use this to visualize your CDAP data sets. Moving back to the slides. So what we saw was it's called this high data studio where we were able to drag and use the drag and drop GUI for data pipeline creation. We also kind of looked at the rich library of pre-built sources. Uh, both bad sources and streaming sources, and uh, a lot of different transforms. Transforms ranging from simply just a JavaScript transform, which just operates record by record, uh, where whether you want to drop certain fields or whether drop records, you can do that. Or you can do like group buys or joining data, which works in a, uh, more than one record, or just a collection of records as well. And, uh, and then, so you know, you can also you. You can also see that we never had a we, we never interacted with the Spark uh, like, uh, like the Spark runtime engine directly. We had a very high level abstraction where we were working with a bunch of sources and sinks and transforms. So this kind of abstracts you away from the execution framework. Uh, so today for batch pipelines we support MapReduce and Spark. So when you're creating your pipeline, you don't have to be uh, you don't have to make a choice in the execution framework. Whatever might so maybe MapReduce works well for your use case, maybe Spark works, works well for your use case. But you don't have to choose, you don't have to be tied to a specific execution framework. So all you need to do is just uh, choose these different sources, things and transform that kind of works, just build your pipeline. And then finally, when you're actually um, executing this pipeline, you can choose whether you want to execute this in MapReduce or whether you want to execute this in Spark. So those are the two execution frameworks that are supported for batch pipelines. For real-time pipelines, we use Spark streaming. Um, as the execution framework. And 
they see the platform itself, which is what Hydrate is built on top of. It's uh, it's Hadoop native and it's also Hadoop distro agnostic. What I mean by that is if you're if you're creating your own pipeline uh, and you're using your Cloudera distribution, let's say you're running it in a new cluster and it's using Cloudera CDH, you don't have to when you let's say you, the same particular pipeline configuration will work exactly on your Hortonworks if you're using HTTP, you want to move to HTTP, or if you're using Mapr, the same exact uh, configuration pipeline configuration will just work. And in fact, if you're if you're going, if you're just stripping one layer away, stripping hydrate away, you want to develop your own complex big data application. Let's say your application is much more complex than a simple ATL pipeline that reads from source, does some transmission rights sync. If you want to implement your own application, you can use that using you can do that using a simple higher level Java API that CDAP provides. And you, then you can build your application and then you can just um, drop the jar on any head of distribution and your same jar will work exactly the same way. So you're not really tied to a specific kind of distribution, it's just under distribution agnostic as well. So if I may paraphrase, yes. what you have done is introduced a layer of abstraction which allows you to focus on the problem that you're solving and you uh, modularize the calls through APIs and whatever to a variety of solutions in the ETL framework. Okay. Yes. So if we bet upon this product, then we're betting in a sense on your ability to keep those connections alive. Right. Is that That's fair? right, yeah. So we as our as a part of our set integration test framework for us, we run a suite of tests across multiple different distributions and different versions of right? so HTTP 2.0, 2.1, 2.1, and so on. So but may I ask how robust the APIs are? Right, so the APIs that we provide or? Well, I'm not sure who's writing the APIs. Are you right. writing to their APIs or are you actually writing the APIs to call them? So we we provide a developer API, which is in, in Java, and that users can use to implement applications if they, if they want to do so. That They can also develop pipelines using the GUI, but they want to go a little more deeper and develop some complex applications, they can do so using our developer API. Uh, and that we make sure that we design and develop that API and we make sure that it's, uh, it doesn't change a lot from version to version and we don't break compatibilities. Underneath, uh, if you're actually working with uh, API that are provided by, like, let's say, HBase, Yarn, or Hive, or all other things, uh, I don't know if you've had experience working with them, they break quite often and they, they just, from release to release, things break quite, quite a lot. So, so you're dependent upon their APIs, right. which have a progressive release sequence. Correct. Right. And we abstract, abstract you away from all those um, complexities and things that keep breaking off. And so, and as you can imagine, the, the different distros, even though they package, let's say, Spark or um, Hive, they have different sort of implementations. And so, so if you're, if you're, so we have, we take care of all these differences between different platforms, and we make sure. Uh, all those complexities are taken care of by the CDAP platform so that you are given a consistent view uh, of uh, your what you can implement on top of the uh, data. And so uh, when, you, when you're using CDAP to develop your hydrated pipelines or like an ETL pipeline or if, let's say if you're going one level below and then developing your own CDAP applications, uh, we capture a lot of metadata, we capture a lot of audit data, for example, um, who started this, I mean, when was this, who still created this application, when did it start, when did it stop, uh, and how, many, how much, when, uh, when were events in, ingested into this platform, and so on. So we capture a lot of this audit data, we, we capture a lot of lineage data as well for you to visualize. So these are all certain important features that are required for enterprises uh, where, uh, these uh, information are very, very important and they want to keep track of this. And, uh, and I also mentioned that uh, about the simple Java API. So we also provide, let's say, for example, we saw a bunch of different sources, things, and transforms. Let's say, for example, you have your own source, uh, so the source for which you don't, you don't see a particular plugin that's available. So we provide simple Java API for you to kind of build your own plugin that uh, talks to your uh, source of interest. 
or so for example, you can simply implement a transform that, that that's not available right now, and then you can just add it to the platform and then you just use it for building your own uh, your pipelines. And so it's it is it comes with like a lot of class load isolation and things like that. So if you have ever developed uh, a, big, a big data application yourself using multiple different technologies, you'd have come across this problem quite often. Uh, so it kind of helps you from um, kind of burning your finger if you're trying to do that yourself uh, using using the native APIs. And then we also have some capabilities to do pre and post for notifications. So for example, if your pipeline is running for a long time, you want to uh, send an email or you want to you want to kind of log log into a specific machine and then uh, write some files. So you can use a lot of like post and pre run notifications. And and I, I don't know whether you noticed that there was there were like numbers next to these different sources and things. I can quickly go back to the uh, pipeline and show you that. So there are these numbers, the number of records that came out uh, of these each different transforms and uh, sources. So these are metrics that are collected by the system, um, and it's all shown to you at one one uh, one place. And you can also look at like logs uh, for this particular pipeline. So you can take a look at all these logs that are uh, coming from different sources. So for example, let's say if you're running a MapReduce job. And this MapReduce job is spawning, let's say, multiple different mappers and reducer, and your cluster is like, like a 20 node or 100 node cluster. So, all these different jobs are running on different nodes. And what CDAP allows you to do is just aggregate all these logs from different sources, and you can just look at it at one single uh, place rather than kind of associating it to different machines. Sorry, just one question. Yeah. So, is this a tool which allows you to configure your solution to a problem just that, or also involves? Like now I'm to deploy, I'm right. ready. So do you allow uh, automatically configure, deploy all those various technologies as well? Uh, so what we, so we, we CDAP is usually installed on top of your Hadoop cluster. So, so you expect the, the expect all of the prerequisite before using this is you correct. have all that in place. Correct. So you either have a like a, a vanilla Apache, um, let's say distro like a big top. Distribution install, or you have a Cloudera, or an Artemox, and a Mapify distribution install. Yeah. And so it can be on premise or cloud. That's not it. So, one common problem that we have found when we are creating our projects is that, let's say today you want to pick up three files from the source mm -hmm. and pass on that and take that file, put those files somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But let's say of the three files, two fail, mm -hmm. and then you have to come back the next day to look up for those two files again. So we have a capability called uh, writing to error data sets. So if your particular data had any some trouble, let's say if you were not able to process it, fine, you can write it to an optional error data set. And then you can kind of come back and look at that particular data set and see if you're if you're looking for a particular CSV format or if you're looking for like five fields, then there's just four fields in that particular thing. Or let's say you are expecting a, an integer, but then there was a string. So you can write that data to an error data set, and then that's just simply a, a file that created on top of HTTPS, and then those records are kind of written there with what what went wrong with that particular record. So the users can kind of come back and take a look at that record. So that's not automated. That is it. That is automated. So in the sense that so if you come back and look up again and find out what the problem and then solve it. Because yes. Yeah. You have to kind of kind of look at that error data set. So you can also create. A, the post run notification that I talked about. So you can uh, kind of send yourself like an email or any sort of notification to whatever form that you want to show that well my pet and brand and this is the number of successful records in there. So from more complicated uh, data pipelines, can you use this Provide for more complex data pipelines, or is it very serial? Yeah. So it so it depends on the particular use case. I'd say in this with Hydrator, you can it kind of covers like most of the use cases that people generally have when they're starting with the data. So when they're just starting, they they have some data and they're on BMS and then they just want to get it to uh, Hadoop or HTML. 
So that for many of those scenarios, and even it goes a little bit further, it helps solve this. So for example, let's say if you want to combine data from two different sources, all those scenarios are kind of covered using this GUI interface and you can build on it. But let's say if you're at if you're up to your needs, you go far beyond just this. So what you can do, as you can see, this particular pipeline is actually implemented as a um, as a program, as a Spark program on, the, on our platform. So this is, a, this is just an application that's deployed for you. So behind the scenes, when you're just developing this UI, uh, the platform just creates an application and then deploys it on the CDAP platform and then starts it. So we are writing those for some really simple use case for users who are not familiar or not comfortable with Java to kind of build these applications. But if you are looking for like complex solution that you want to develop, uh, you can use the CDAP API, which is a Java API. Um, that provides a lot of different capabilities that you are probably looking for, and it helps you develop. You can you can ingest data. You can create what are called streams. You can ingest data into that in using HTTP. You can do real time crossing using Floats, which is our own uh, stream crossing framework. And you can combine it with like batch crossing using MapReduce and Spark. And then uh, we have our own abstractions on top of HBase, so that you can use data sets that we have. And then you can be also something called services, by right, which you can serve the data using HTTP um, calls. And so you can develop a really complex big data application using our Java API, and then you can do that in So all the the logging, all, all the data, uh, like build, once you build the jar, you get all the goodness of the logging metrics, uh, order track, track, uh, lineage, all that are provided by the platform. And we also provide something called transactions. On top, uh, using the platform where I can talk to you about that in detail, um, which provides, it basically provides asset transactions on top of the chase. That's provided by the platform, so it makes the life of developing an application on um, I think we kind of covered this part. So, as I mentioned, there are a bunch of different order box integrations that you get once you download our SDK. All these integrations are just available for you to just use right out of the box. If you are Looking for uh, something that's not available in this particular out of the box integration, so you can just you can uh, develop your own using the Java API that we provide. Or you, if you have any specific queries or if you have any specific needs, just shoot us an email. It's all completely open source as well. I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Um, so just a quick example of what are, what does the API look like? Because simple is a very related term. Right? So how does an API look? So, if you are looking to develop your own transform, let's say you are you are looking to just um, implement a transform where you want to check a particular field's um, value, and then you just want to just emit only that and then drop the rest of it. So, in this case, you're just but you can use the JavaScript transform for, for that. But I'm just using it as a simple scenario where let's say if that was not available, you want to do something like that. So, this is just the uh, the class, abstract class, then you just need to extend this particular class and you just implement this particular transform method. Where you get a particular input and then you have an emitter where you can emit the processed data. So you just need to implement this function and that's it and your, your plugin is done. You can just add it to the platform and then you can create your And you can make, once you have created this plugin, you can make it available to all the developers in your company to kind of use that. So uh, as you can Im imagine this way, Probably help a lot of data analysts. So you have a few developers who, are, who know about, let's say, Spark ML library. So they can create a uh, machine learning plugin for all your data scientists to kind of use across your company. So does this run in single JVM, or this itself has a distributed nature to it, where the pipelines can be really packed? Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, if you're running, if, when you're running it in SDK, when you're not running an SDK running on your laptop. The whole CDAP runs in one single JVM. But when you're actually running it on top of a cluster where you have a Hadoop cluster installed, uh, this will it make use of the YARN application framework to kind of deploy applications. So it just it's in the Hadoop native application. So what whatever is the scalability of YARN, uh, we just make use of that. And so for every pipeline, uh, with every job, it's going to be a separate Spark application that's not that's not using YARN. And so whatever your cluster can accommodate, however yarn jobs it can run, whatever memory and uh, memory capacity and virtual cores it has, it can just utilize all that. And so the CDAP itself, as a, you can imagine as 
some people have questions about well, is an abstraction layer how much uh, overhead it's going to consume? And so CDAP itself is just a process that's going to run on one single node on your on your cluster, uh, and it just delegates, it just creates, it just launches run jobs whenever you're trying to start these particular pipelines. And so uh, it doesn't, um, it's not a huge overhead, and whatever scalability that you're getting with Yarn, yeah, you just get that. And you can have you can have multiple installations of CDAP for HA. Uh, purposes, but um, you're just installing it on one to your master nodes and HTML and that's all. And your data node, nothing is installed on you. So, with the whole transformation, for example, in this yes. case, right, it's, a, it's one process for one node. I suppose I have a different sub processes. Do we have any, some kind of a reserve or something that I can do transformations, right? Simple transformation. Otherwise, it's the programmer that has to make it. Right, right. So, as I showed you before, this. The, the pipeline that I showed before, uh, that was just a drag and drop. If, uh, so you can just drag and drop certain, uh, I can just show you uh, real quick. Um, uh, let's see. So this one, you can simply, excuse me, sorry, I'll just go to. So I have a bunch of different transforms here. So all I need to do is just click, drag and drop this, connect this to this one. And I'm just getting some processing order. So you don't have to write Java code or just go to this particular API unless and unless you don't find any specific transform that's actually missing. So. What happens when you drag and drop? Is there, you have like a DSM behind the scenes which kind of you know, uses that kind of transform to create some kind of problem? Yeah, so uh, what happens is, uh, let's show this exports to you. So what? I mean, behind the scenes, what's happening is the the UI that's running kind of converts this particular pipeline configuration into this JSON file, where uh, it just mentions that there's this Kafka source, there's this time windowing thing happening, then there is a batch aggregator, and uh, let's see if I can find. Uh, and this is how it's connected. So from the Kafka source to the time window, and the time window to the aggregation. So this is just the configuration, the JSON configuration that's just generated. And then it's just uh, sent to an inbuilt application that we already packaged with CDAP SDK. And uh, it just creates a new application using this configuration. And that's all. So this is all happening behind the scenes, and the user doesn't even know about it. And the application understands how to uh, interpret this particular uh, configuration. And so what ends up happening is this. when you launch, when you run this pipeline, the Spark job starts up, and then it knows. Uh, you need to read from this Kafka source, so it knows how to read from a specific, using the plugins that we had seen before, it knows how to read from a variety of these different sources. So it, it knows how, how to read from Kafka source, and it uses these properties that you have, been, uh, that you have given here. So for example, uh, this the brokers, the Kafka brokers in the topic. So it, that's all you need to configure, and it uses this configuration to talk to your Kafka uh, brokers and then fetch the data. And then all these uh, transforms are just simple function calls. So for each data that's coming in, let's say I just want to compute uh, whether it's greater than or less than that particular altitude. So it just invokes that method on uh, each of those particular uh, events that are kind of coming in. So that's how it's kind of implemented in the back end. So the user is, is not going to modify this pipeline uh, So you can, you can modify it yourself if you want to by hand. That's yeah, API to basically look at these JSON you know, snippets and say, well, I'm going to be changing my configuration from this to this. Right. Using some kind of so you can use it. You can use the GUI, the graphical user interface, to do that. So, for example, I can just clone my pipeline. Let's say I have a different uh, copy too, uh, where let's say I don't want to. I want to change the altitude values. Let's say I don't want 500. Let's say I want 1,000. So I just I just created this new pipeline that I can just deploy and run. So you don't have to really manually change the configuration file unless do you really need to. But I've just published my new pipeline by just changing some using the GUI. You can just change all these configuration. Okay. Questions are different. Right? Questions no, are my question is: Let's say yeah, I have yeah, yeah. my pipeline and I want to productionize it, yeah. and I've tested this in my test environment. Yeah. Then I have a separate configuration. I want to use a programmatic API yeah. to basically say, well, 
this was the designer sure. uh, output, but now I need to use this or I have yeah. to yeah. And I don't want you know someone in the production environment to go and click around. <laughs> and Correct. Generate, uh, yeah. Generate. So you can save <laughs> you can save the configuration. Uh, I mean, we just ex we can export it as a JSON file, and then you can use that configuration to uh, and then. But then there are certain um, so that that way you can get a that's you can code version I mean version it if you want to. Uh, there are also something called macros that you can use to, for example, let's say this Kafka source from which you're reading in your development environment it could be something else, but in your production environment it's going to be a totally different broker. So you can use that you can use what's called uh, macros to kind of use it's a dollar and then a filler so that you can use and then in the production environment that value can be completely different. And so it will pick it up from your development production environment, and you can just directly use. So you don't have to modify the pipelines configuration also. So you just you can just use it. Just. Can you change transforms one to the other? To yes, the you can, and you can have multiple different sources. You can have multiple different things. And it's just a simple uh, example. So I'm just running out of a few more minutes, I think, but I was quickly walking this slide. I think we pretty much covered most of it. So uh, I think I just briefly talked about this as well. So the Hadoop ecosystem, as you can imagine, has a bunch of these different technologies, a lot of complexities, each one of them have its own individual works. And so CDAP, the class data application platform kind of sits on top of this ecosystem, abstracts away these different um, these different technologies and provides you one unified framework on which you can develop your applications. And and specifically for the ETL use cases. We have something called Tracker, that, that's the demo that we saw today, where you can use a GUI based environment to kind of construct your ETL pipelines and then um, build and then run all of them without writing a single line of code. And uh, and then you can, and as, you, as we saw, it's also runtime agnostic, so you can choose to produce part. Today we have Spark streaming support, tomorrow we, we may have some other uh, real-time um, real -time processing pipeline. Really crossing runtime So, so that's that's how that's just a one page on how it looks like. And then we kind of talk, briefly talked about this this particular logical pipeline that we saw where it contains a bunch of different sources, transforms, and then saves. Uh, and then we saw this JSON file that's kind of generated and then just sent to the particular application. There is a planner that's sitting in the application that converts it into actual map producer Spark or a Spark code actually, and so it just runs that for you, and all of this is kind of hidden, and this is what happens underneath. Um, and and we kind of talked about this before. And uh, this is for the real time data pipeline case, which is the example that we saw. We are generating micro batches of data in regular intervals, and then we support the sliding windows and aggregation of the various different platforms. And uh, the checkpointing of the pipeline state is coming soon. So what this means is, let's say I stop my pipeline and I start once again. I want to just start off from the Kafka offset where I just lost it. Right? So this is a feature that's kind of uh, coming up in the next version. But uh, um, and so the Spark. So if, I don't know if how many people are aware of Spark streaming or Spark itself in general. But uh, what we are using in the background is called Spark D streams and um, this generates an RDD for every batch of work. So RDD um, is the kind of uh, if you imagine this, imagine that as a, a set of uh, events or a set of uh, records. And so in this case, when we were reading from Kafka, we were getting a set of records every every minute. And this is what we are kind of processing. And so this windowing is is a kind of concept where when you are getting this different uh, bunch of events every batch interval. So you can imagine that I want to, let's say, process this three um, three sets of events together and I want to slide my window uh, at every time. So for example, in the case that we had saw, we were processing one minute worth of data and then we were just sliding that window for every minute. So I just process zero to one minutes worth of data and then I process one to this second minute for the data and so on. So you can also slide your win window at a different frequency as well. So you can get like sliding averages sort of thing. And so this might make a lot more sense for some people who are familiar with Spark streaming, but you don't have to look into that. Um, 
So then this is the ODBC connector part. So as I mentioned, we provide these ODBC connectors for you to um, you use it along with the BI tools to explore C that data sets. So to get some good visualization out of it. So you don't have to even write like SQL queries and so on. And that will allow you to get um, interact with the data a lot more easily, much more intuitively. Uh, so the second oh, so how do you handle duplication? I'm sorry? How do you handle duplication? Handle duplication. Duplicate duplicate the uh, record. So it's up to you to do that in your pipeline. Like uh, we have some plugins which are called deduplicators. So if you have duplicate records, it can look for a specific field to identify which which are the duplicate records, and then it can choose either one of them randomly or it can choose the max value out of it. So you can just drag and drop actually a, a actually a transform that can help you do that. You but have you have that test. Yes. yes. So as you're on this slide, you yeah. want to start with before. Uh, so um, you're using an ODBC connector. A lot of ODBC connectors, uh, they have an issue that they rely on the lock-on connection, like with the lock-on instance to do all the joins and all this kind of stuff. So obviously for large data set, that's not an option. So are you able to leverage the bit faster for doing this operation behind the scene? So that's the first question. Second question, how about the schema definition? And you have, let's say, a pile here and a pile of whatever I've seen that you have on the server level for that. Obviously, you have a meta store that comes within those two frameworks. So, let's say you didn't have any meta store there, just to say GFS. So, how do you manage to do, uh, let's say, the schema definition for that solution? Right. So, we create, so, uh, to answer your first question, so you, you, if, if there are some uh, performance restrictions on the ODBC driver in front, then what you can do is you can just go directly, if you're comfortable with just writing SQL queries, you can directly go to our CDAP UI, go to the Explorer, like write your SQL query there, and then that will just launch Hive jobs. And if you're, if you're plus, if you have a Hive installed and running on your computer. So you need to have Hive. Yes, you need to have Hive. So you're leveraging Hive. Or in Hive. Yes, exactly. So that's how you manage the that's, that's schema right. definition. Okay. Right. Yeah. So there is no magic there. I'm yeah. hoping to get something that will make that life easier. <laughs> oh, I see. So uh, it kind of happens, but for example, when you're creating a data set, we already created a high table in the background for you. So you don't have to, yeah, we, we create that in the background for you. So you don't have to manually go and create a high table okay. for your data set. So when I created that particular time partition file set, or if I'm creating this, um, like an HBase table, which is which is called a table in our, uh, in CDAP. So we have higher levels uh, abstractions on top of HBase tables. So it's high for What's Usually for analytics, it would be high, right? So, uh, so we, do you have a pattern there that you would suggest to do it for this kind of So when, you, when you're creating a CDAP data set, we, uh, we, already, we also, when you're creating that, and it can be underlying, it can be stored in HBSR, uh, HGFS, we also create a high table for that. And then we, and so whenever you're issuing the SQL queries, it's, you're, you're just issuing select star from my CDAP data set one. Underlying, it actually issues a Hive query and it knows how to get that data uh, from the HDFS or from uh, HBase or wherever it stores. So you write to both. You write to a Hive and then Yeah, you write to a metadata. You just write the metadata to the metadata, Hive metadata store about where that particular data is actually stored. Um, so, but then it creates a Hive table with an external storage uh, with the data managed with something else, but you just tell the metadata in the Hive. So, and this is all taken care of by the platform. You don't have to go and create an application. So, let's uh, see the level you select if you want to store it in your Hive or in some sage base. You, you store, you, you choose. It's not good at querying papers. Yeah. Right. So, you choose whether you want to store your data in edge base. I mean, you have you have some higher level abstractions in CDAP for the CDAP data sets. Um, so, it can be a, a key value table or a simple. Uh, simple table, and these are just abstractions on top of HBase. You can also have, you have something called file sets. Uh, so I wrote the data to actually a file set, which is actually an abstraction on top of HGFS. So in all these, so depending upon what you, you can choose, whichever works best for your particular application. But whatever you choose, and you actually you can actually query or explore that using SQL queries directly. So you don't have to uh, go manually create something linking that to high. So if you have any specific questions about that, maybe we can yeah, take sure. it off. Sure. Sure. But that's a common thing. Okay. Yeah, so you don't have to use the flow. So you can just do your, all your operations just on the CDAP UI. You don't have to go and uh, 
and we need only creating high tables for your tables. Or like views or something like that. Yeah. So I I mentioned about the chip pointing capability that's kind of coming up. I just mentioned the Jira number here because if someone's really familiar with open source development, all our Jiras are open source, our code is open source. So you can view, you can look at what we're working on for the next release and so on. And you look at our code and our contributions are also welcome if you're interested in contributions. And so, yeah, thank you so much uh, for coming. And uh, this is our uh, mailing list. Uh, if you are, please check out the SDK. And if you have any questions about, if you are stuck somewhere, if you have any other questions about some support that you're looking for, just share me at this particular email address. Uh, and this is the link to our GitHub repositories. Uh, this is for the CDAP platform itself, and these are for the specific plugins that we support. So just check that out, and uh, your contributions are welcome. Thank you so much.